All right, hello students. Welcome to another video lecture for COMSAI 125 Operating Systems. So in this chapter, we are now on chapter 21. In this chapter, we're going to talk about uh, swapping mechanisms. So in the previous chapter, we talked about uh, the different approaches to further optimize the use of the page table by introducing techniques like uh, mixing, uh, paging, and uh, segmentation, and also multi-level paging, as well as inverted page tables. So the idea there is that we can still optimize the use of the page table by reducing the size that the page table is occupying. So today we're go going to talk about the swapping mechanisms. But before we proceed to the swapping mechanism, let us review the memory hierarchy in a computer system. So as you can see in this triangle, we have uh, the triangle here. At the top, we have the registers. These are fast storage but they have limited capacity in 64-bit system. For example, in x86, you have different RAX, RBX. Those are examples of general purpose registers, which are uh, basically flip-flops. Then we have the cache, and then we have the main memory. And finally, at the bottom, we have the mass storage, which include hard disk and tape. And basically, they have, they're slower, but they have larger capacity. So in modern, uh, the OS need a place to stash away portions of the address space of the process that are, are currently uh, in great demand. So the idea here is uh, in a system that supports multi-programming and uh, providing a, an infinite address space for a process, it is a common scenario that probably we're, we're going to run out of memory, but we don't want the processes to know that we are running out of actual physical memory. So we need to save uh, some of the memory area or pages that are being used by processes and save uh, these pages to this. And that is basically the purpose of this chapter. How do we swap out this uh, unused uh, pages so that uh, other processes can run, okay? So let's talk about using uh, sing, uh, the advantage of using a single large address for a process. Now, the idea here is we want a process. We don't want to, uh, to burden the programmer of uh, manually managing the memory for, for his code and data to be uh, properly placed in memory for execution or for processing. So we try to, the operating system tries to abstract the process such that the programmer can just basically request as much memory as a process pro, as his program needs uh, and no need to consider the placement of this memory in the, of this memory in the actual physical memory. So no manual process is needed for the uh, for the programmer. But that is only uh, useful for a single process. But if you have a system with a lot of uh, concurrently running processes at some point in time, the physical memory may actually run out. For example, you have an eight gigabyte uh, memory and you have a uh, hundred tabs for in your Chrome browser, okay? So if you have a hundred tabs open in your Chrome browser, the eight gigabyte of RAM will not actually, in reality will not actually be sufficient, but each of the tabs will think that they are actually utilizing, they are still able to utilize the main memory. They have full access to the main memory. So that's the idea of uh, this uh, uh, swapping mechanism. 
Okay, so in addition of swap space, uh, the addition of swap space allows the OS support the illusion of a large virtual memory for multiple concurrently running processes. Now let's take a look at what this uh, swap space is. The swap space, uh, the idea here is to reserve some space on the disk for moving pages, pages back and forth. Now, if you install the, uh, in the case of Run25, if you install the VM from scratch from the ISO, and during the partitioning stage of the disk, if you did not use the uh, automatic uh, partitioning or disk uh, partitioning scheme, uh, by default, or even though you use the automatic partitioning scheme, there will be a swap partition in the installation of Linux. This swap partition is actually used for moving these pages back and forth. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll have an exact, a demonstration of that later. But this is how uh, it will look like. Essentially, you have the OS. We need to remember uh, to remember to the so, uh, will basically uh, map the physical pages to corresponding blocks in the disk. Later, when we talk about persistence, we're going to talk about blocks, disk blocks. Right? You can think of disk blocks as a group of sectors in the in your lab. You have the bootloader uh, lab. Uh, you were very new, you access sectors. If you have a group of sectors, you can treat them as a, an, a block and, uh, and use them as one. But uh, in this uh, slide, what is being shown here is that we have the physical memory here. And these are the corresponding physical frame number. So the physical at this point, uh, we have four physical frames, frame uh, page, uh, physical frame number zero, physical frame number one, physical frame number two, and physical frame number three. And if we have a paging uh, system, we can say that this can be, this can be the virtual page number or the, the, uh, the, a page for process zero. So the VPN uh, virtual page number zero for of process zero is mapped to the physical frame number zero in the physical memory. Here, in this in this uh, illustration here, these these two uh, pages or these two frames are actually used by uh, process one. So process one is using these two frames, and uh, page uh, physical frame number one is uh, is mapped to the virtual page number two of process one and the process uh, physical frame number uh, two is mapped to the virtual page number three of process one. And finally, we have process two here, wherein the virtual page number zero of process two is mapped to the physical frame number three. So I hope that that is clear. So this is the physical memory. Now, what if we have a swapping system, swap space? We can have uh, this is will be this will be the structure of the swap space, the swap partition, and the logical division of the swap partition will be in terms of blocks. Okay, and the blocks will represent usually will be of the same size as the page size. So, for example. Uh, In the swap space, let's take a look at proc zero, process zero. So which blocks in the swap space is uh, are being used by processor uh, process zero? As you can see, block zero and block one are used by process zero. Specifically, the virtual page number one of process zero is mapped to block zero. And the virtual page number two of process zero is mapped to block one. So you can just interchange this with this, okay? So you see the, the mapping uh, in this uh, example. So 
that's why when the swap space is basically just like the a mirror image of uh, the physical memory in terms of uh, the pages, the paging mechanism. Uh, everything that is uh, in the physical memory is supposedly to be currently active pages. But as you can see here, in the subspace, we actually have process three, and there is no there is no virtual page or there is no page map to the physical memory. So that means process three is not currently in the main memory, meaning there's no part, okay, no part of the the other space of process three is in currently in the main in the main memory. Process three is entirely in the swap space currently. So I hope this illustration gave, uh, gave you some idea of the relationship between the two. So basically, you just uh, you just change this label, the physical frame number to corresponding blocks will represent the disk logical blocks, and physical frame number will represent the physical memory. Now, we need to add some machinery uh, into the system to determine whether, since we are supporting uh, swapping in and swapping out of uh, pages to and from the disk okay, to the main memory, we need uh, some way of indicating whether a page is in the main memory or not. So the hardware should provide some form of or a flag. So usually that flag is called the present bit. When the value of the present bit is actually a field in the page table entry, recall our discussion about the page table entry, we can add a field called the present bit. And if the value is one, that means that that page is in the main memory. And if it is zero, then it is on disk. So this is just an addition, additional hardware support in order to uh, provide swapping mechanism. So assuming that uh, we're we now have a swap space okay, and we introduce the present bit, what if the memory is uh, full okay, and uh, there is no place to page in or to place in a new page. So let's say, for example, in this scenario, let's, let's say at some point, process three needs to be executed. But currently, everything in the physical memory, all the pages or all the physical frames in the main memory are currently occupied. So essentially, the physical memory is full. What is going to happen? So when that situation arises then there should be a page replacement policy that will determine which of these pages will be swapped out to this to give way to free up some space for process three to be placed in the main memory for example we might remove this page we might remove this page or we might remove this page. So we're going to talk about the page replacement policy in the next chapter, but it's important that whenever the memory is full, some pages will have to be paged out and selecting those pages will be determined by the page replacement policy. Now let's take a look at the page fault. So what do we mean by a page fault? So you already have a lab for this. So the page fault will happen when the page you are accessing is not in memory. For example, at some point, process three is uh, invoked, but process three is not in the main memory. And let's say process three, okay, so there are, uh, Two pages, process three has two pages, page zero, VPN zero and VPN one. And both of these pages are not in memory. 
So if you try to access, let's say, VPN zero of process three, this is not in the main memory. So that will be a uh, page four. So uh, if a page is not present, it has been swapped out to disk, as in the case of process three in the illustration earlier, the OS need to swap the page into memory in order to service the page four. Okay, so here is a more uh, illustrative okay, visualization of a page four. So here, let's say we have this instruction load M. So this load M will require a memory reference. M. So you're trying to access a memory location. So it will try to look at the page table. Okay? And of course, we know that the page table is a mapping from the page uh, virtual page number to the physical frame number, physical frame. And when the page, uh, each row here is a page table entry. Now, in this page table entry, the value for the valid or invalid bit is I, meaning it is invalid. When you say invalid, the page is not in uh, memory. Okay? So we take note that we don't have a TLB here. We don't have a TLB here. So we have direct access to the page table. So if we have an invalid bit here, then that will be a page fault. So the OS has set up a page fault handler and it will generate a trap to the OS kernel. Okay. And then the OS will check uh, whether the page exists in the secondary storage or the swap space. If it exists on the swap space, it will read that page and allocate a page frame, uh, select a free page frame and load that into that area. This is basically what you did in the lab, but in, uh, here we don't have a TLD. So once it's in the, uh, in the, this is the physical memory, once the page is in the physical memory, we update the page table, and then we restart the instruction, okay? We restart the uh, instruction, okay? So it's called here instruction, but basically we restart the instruction. And after, when the, when the instruction is restarted, of course, uh, this will now be valid because the frame has been loaded from this, okay? So it shows, it shows here that the page table entry is used for data, such as the page frame number of the disk for a disk address, okay? So here, for example, we have a page fault. We are trying to access VP, uh, VPN zero of uh, process three, but it is not in the physical memory. So probably we have a page table somewhere. So uh, if we have this, if, if this is the total amount of memory, we're going to have a page table like this. Okay. And uh, this will be the entries. PFN zero, PFN one, PFN two, PFN three. So that will be the, this will be the PFN. So let's say. Uh, so remember that uh, there is a page table for each process. So we have uh, for process zero. For process zero, uh, if we're going to construct the page, let's say let's construct the, the page table for process zero. For process zero, uh, how many pages does process zero have? Zero, uh, 
Wow, three pages, right? So we have three pages. So this will be zero, one, two, three, for example. This will be the process, uh, the VPN for, uh, this is process zero. Okay, so process zero is now in a memory. So this will be PFN zero. Okay. And then the others will be invalid because uh, assuming that we, we, we we're going to ignore this because uh, the process zero has only three entries for this example. So this is how it will look like for process zero. So we can also construct uh, process one. So process one has how many pages? So process one has two, three, uh, zero, and so process one has four pages. So you get the idea of, of this mechanism. So that's essentially what happens uh, in the control flow whenever a page for course. So looking at the pseudocode, how this uh, uh, will be implemented. So there are two parts here. We have uh, the control flow, the page for control flow for the hardware and the software. So remember uh, the hardware part will be similar to the previous uh, pseudocodes. So we are given a virtual address. We have to get the virtual page number. So we do the masking and then the shifting. So we get the VPN. Then the VPN, we use the VPN to look it up on the TLB. If there is a TLB hit, okay, we have to check whether we have the correct permissions. If we have the correct permissions, then we can get the offset from the virtual address by using a bitwise end using the offset mask. And then we can get the actual physical address using the code given earlier or before in our chapters. So we have the TLB entry here. We extract the physical frame number, shift it to the left, and then we or the offset to get the actual physical address and then we access the memory. So this is the uh, standard way, the standard uh, flow that will happen if the there is a TLB hit, the VPN is in the TLB. Otherwise, if you don't have uh, uh, here, if you don't have the correct permissions, you will get a uh, protection fault, meaning you are not allowed to access that particular uh, memory. Now, in the case of a TLB me, so again, here we are assuming that the TLB is hard, uh, controlled by the hardware. So we have a, a TLB miss. So if we have a TLB miss, we have to consult the, we have to find the page table entry first, right? In the actual page table. I remember that this is a, an expensive operation because you have to access the, the physical memory to get the page table entry. So to be able to do that, we need to have, we need to add the, virtual page number uh, multiplied by the size of the page table entry to the value in the page table base register because the page table register tells us where in the physical memory is the start of the page table so that will be the actual pte address in the page table and the actual uh, page table entry is obtained by using a memory access so now, if the page table entry is not valid, then we raise a segmentation fault. So it's probably uh, if there is no association, either uh, it's not actually being used. So we have a segmentation fault. Otherwise, if it is valid, we have to check again if we are allowed to access that page table entry. So if, if not, then that will be a protection fault. And if we also have to check if, whether the page table or the page is in the memory. 
So if it is in the main memory, then we're just going to uh, insert to the TLB, the VPN, the page table entry, uh, physical frame number, and then the protection bit. So we have to insert that into the DLB and then you restart the instruction. And when you restart the instruction, of course, you just inserted the TLB and a new TLB entry, then this will be a TLB uh, hit now on, after the restart of the instruction. Now, if the, if the page is not in the physical memory, then that is when you're going to use, or that is when you're going to raise the page fault exception. And of course, the page fault exception, uh, this uh, page fault here will uh, generate a trap, right? So this will be, this will be the trap, which is actually the page, the page fault handler is defined by the operating system. Okay. And this is what the page fault handler is going to do. First, it will find a free physical uh, page. It will try to find a free frame. So let's say this one is free. Okay. And when that happens, Okay. Uh, if uh, there is no uh, free uh, free frame, okay, no free physical page, then you need to uh, run a replacement algorithm, page replacement algorithm, and uh, this function here here will return a physical frame number that has just been freed, right? And then the disk read will be, uh, will be initiated and this will be the disk address which is stored in the PTE, basically this is just a black number. And then uh, this should be capital PFN anyway, it should be the PFN. And of course, the disk read will take some time. So this is an IO operation and uh, the process will block. And then after the disk read, okay, uh, the present uh, bit will be set to true. And then the page table entry, that PFN will be set to the PFN here. And then uh, you retry the instruction. This retry instruction will actually probably result in a TLB miss first. And then uh, after that, uh, it will uh, refresh the TLB and the next restart will result in a successful uh, lookup in the TLB. So that's uh, what happens. Right. So at this point, you probably have some idea now of uh, what happens when your assembly program accesses a memory, a location in memory, uh, when you run, uh, let's say, uh, uh, your assembly code in, uh, in Linux. Okay. So the key takeaway here for the page, this is basically, this is basically the page fault handler is that are, are this. So you have the eviction in case the, the physical memory is full and the disk read, which actually uh, based on the block number. So you, you read uh, the block number and then uh, place that in the physical frame number. So probably to better visualize this. So let's say, uh, there is a page fault when you access something from process three, okay? So this block five, for example, will be present in the page table uh, entry for uh, process three. So, 
when does the replacement happen? When when should this uh, uh, actually happen? As you can see here in the control flow or the pseudocode, the eviction evict page function happens when there are no more uh, physical page frames available, right? So the OS waits until the memory is entirely full and only then replaces the page to make room for some other page. This is a little bit unrealistic and there are many reasons for the OS to keep a small portion of memory free more proactively. So the idea here is that the OS will not wait for the physical memory to be fully occupied, to be full. Okay, so instead, uh, it sets some low threshold and high threshold values. Uh, basically, these are the count of uh, uh, available, uh, available minimum, basically minimum and maximum available free pages. And whenever, the available pages is below this uh, threshold, this low watermark, then a background thread that is responsible for, for freeing memory, meaning the swap, swap daemon will, uh, will run. Right? And then the swap daemon will uh, evict as many pages as it, uh, uh, as it can until it reaches the uh, desired number of available uh, free pages. Okay, so that's the idea. So these are some useful uh, commands that you can use in Linux to view the status of the uh, swap space. And of course, the the subspace used by different process. So let's uh, try uh, this. Okay, so we are here in the terminal. So the first command that uh, we can try is the swap on. Okay, so the swap on show output call. So swap on. Uh, does the show output all. So as you can see uh, in this uh, virtu uh, virtual machine that I have, so this is the swap file, the name of the swap file, and then the, the type is file and the size is two gigabyte. So that, may that means that the swap space used for this is two gigabyte. And currently the use uh, swap space is 4.8 megabyte only. So we have, uh, a lot of available uh, space uh, at the moment. Then uh, we can also use the free command. So let's try the free command, free minus M. So the result is almost the same, okay? So we have two gigabyte. So you have two gigabyte here for the swap. And uh, the used one is the used amount is 4.8, so we just rounded down to 4 uh, MB. Right? So these are uh, uh, commands. The other one is we can use the smem command if you, if you haven't installed this. So you can use the smem command to view the swap space for the uh, processes and uh, libraries. So you can see here the swap uh, swap column, which shows 
uh, the subspace used by the different uh, libraries and uh, uh, processes. Okay. So this is uh, the result of that. Now you can also use the VM swap uh, the VM swap uh, property pay of processes. So okay, so I've used this command. Okay, so let's dissect this command line. First, let's uh, run this. So what it does is to actually display the swap space that are being used by the process that are currently running. So this is the name of the process, and this is the size of the swap space being used. Let's say we have system D uses uh, 872 kilobytes, etc. So, as you can see at the moment, there are uh, some of the processes don't use the uh, subspace yet, right? Because we only have a, a few processes running here, right? So, what does what this command does is to check all the processes in the prop uh, directory and then check for the VM swap uh, field, right? And then uh, display that and then sort that and then pipe that to uh, less. Okay, so as you can see in this uh, example, we have a tracker miner here, okay? Now, if let's say, we, let's try to open, uh, let's try to open Firefox. If we try to open Firefox, let's say let's see the what the behavior will be. So Firefox is ready, and let's see if Firefox will be using some subspace. So at this moment. Firefox is not uh, using any swap space yet. Okay, but you get the idea. Get the idea. The important uh, part here is the VM swap. So let's say cut from dollar dollar status. So you can see here the uh, you can see here the VM swap uh, property, and that is basically what is being done in here. So let's try that. So let's take a look at Firefox. What is the process name for uh, Firefox? There is no Firefox process. We only have uh, web content here. So let's try that. Let's try this web content for zero for one. And let's see if we have uh, VM swap. So still not using subspace. Get the issue the command to check. Uh, 
Uh, so the gnome shell is eating uh, a lot of soft space. So we can still uh, use the swap one to check. And as you can see, the soft space at this point increased to 52.5 MB. So there's some uh, swapping out and swapping it in that are happening. And actually, the the so a while ago we are talking we were talking about the page paging daemon or the swap daemon. So actually in Linux, uh, this is actually the k swap d. So this is the swapper daemon. This is responsible for uh, performing the eviction of uh, pages, right? So if you can, uh, you can look at top. So this is actually a kernel process. So you can see that there are no these are there are no nice values or there are no uh, virtual memory use because this is part of uh, it's basically a kernel thread right, that is uh, running uh, running inside the kernel. So to get more details of the process, so, so you can see that's almost all black because it is a, a background uh, thread, background kernel thread. Okay, so that will be all for this chapter. See you on the uh, next chapter.